Hey everyone, okay. thanks for listening. Uh, today I'm talking with Andrea. She's on Twitter as at the other ninety five, or and also you can find her on YouTube. She has a channel of the same name. And I've been watching her stuff for the last little bit, and she's got a little bit of an interesting take on some things. And I'm speaking to her today because she put out a tweet the other day about traveling for school, and traveling is something I love and I've done a lot of, and I think more people should travel more. So I wanted to get her on here to talk about traveling and talking about maybe some of her videos and her views. And hey, Andrea, thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, like you mentioned that tweet that you traveled to Ethiopia, right, for school. Mm -hmm. So was that your first time, like, away by yourself or had you traveled before? Or, like, what, you, what got you interested in doing that? Yeah, I had traveled before I went and I did this kind of like school exchange kind of thing in Scotland uh, where we kind of it, it's a like I come from a Christian background. So it was one of those, you know, study and then go and serve mission wise kind of thing. So it's not Mormon, though, just to be clear, it's not Mormon, not Mormon mission. But it was uh, so I did that in Scotland for uh, for six months when I was 19. But this was specifically for my degree. I, re I received credits for it. It was, I believe, worth uh, say two two classes worth of credits. And so I went to uh, Ethiopia for 10 days. And then I actually went on to uh, Israel for uh, one month after that. So the, the, my degree is uh, Christian studies with a minor in history. And so it was, that's pretty much why it made sense with my degree. So, okay, I understand Israel, but I'm wondering, like, why Ethiopia? You know, so actually, it's because we went specifically to study the Eastern Orthodox Church in Ethiopia. Okay. They have quite a few old, like ancient rock churches there that are inhabited by a small number of monks that just live there always. And the interesting thing about Ethiopia is that in Aksum, which is in the north, and I think it used to be the capital before it moved to Addis Ababa, you can fact check me on that. But so the city of Aksum has the alleged the Ark of the Covenant resides in this this old church in yes in this city called Axum and according to them it's um yeah I, so we don't know it's there because no one's allowed to see it it's it's fabled that it's there they have one guy who guards it until he dies and then it's replaced with someone he's replaced with someone else and i mean he'll come out and say hi in, into the little courtyard because it's fenced off you know to the to the crowd sometimes he didn't when we were there but so we we went and saw the the place and then the church and then the courtyard with the guy and then the door so we saw it we just didn't see the actual thing so that was interesting that's that's why that's one of the reasons why Ethiopia is on the radar. Also, it's um, it's fabled. There's a lot of fables here. So it's fabled that a uh, King Solomon went over and like had a, an affair with the Queen of Sheba, yeah. which was Ethiopia, and their son was King Menelik the first, which is one of their great kings. And so that's, you know, kind of a bit of a, a Jewish connection. So it, anyway, so it's an interesting, interesting uh, sort of study of their traditions and their how they practice the, orth the Orthodox Church and whatnot. So, so that was interesting. But I mostly went because I wanted to go to Israel because I've always wanted to go to Israel. Okay. And so, I mean, in Israel, I mean, obviously, you know, that's the birthplace of all birthplace of two of the three Abrahamic faiths, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess you could argue it's kind of the birthplace of the three because they all stem off from each other. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, like, did you find it difficult? Did you find, you know, like I've worked in war zones, so I just like, 
were you aware of like any kind of danger? Like, were you on more alert there than you would be somewhere else? Um, I mean, not that Ethiopia is the safest either with like the strife they have with Eritrea and stuff, right? So. No, you know, I, well, we were with a group of, I'd say 40 people. So it's mostly students, but then also some just people who came along for the travel study. So it felt quite safe. I also have, I kind of just believe if someone tells me we'll be fine, I just am like, okay. So I have a bit of, and, and I, you can see, cause that's where we, we really know each other is from Twitter. You can see that on Twitter. Sometimes I'm just a little bit blissfully ignorant. Um, so I, well, my, my professor had gone about 10 times. So I, I believed that, you know, that was fine. And we also took precautions as well. I mean, we, if we took the bus, which we didn't very often, we usually had our own buses, mm -hmm. but if we did take the bus into town, we always went on Arab buses and that's, you know, you probably know this, but that's because that's not bombed. No, like please. we're doing the Jewish bus. Well, at the time it wasn't, it was on the safest bet, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, we did take precautions, but I mean, we went into the West Bank. Like we, we could walk there from where we are, the complex where we stayed and we had to bring our passports. We walked, we would walk go in, we went for Shisha there. It was, hey, don't it was get me wrong. I, I wasn't saying like, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do it. Like if I got a chance, I, I'd no. do it in a heartbeat. but yeah, that, that, that's just what I mean. Like, were you just aware or were like, you a little bit more mm. cautious? Uh, okay. Because I'll give you an example. Like I was overseas for close to 13 years. Seven of them were in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And we got taught over and over and over again about situational awareness. Um, you know, mm -hmm. every couple of months they would do refresher courses on like mine awareness and things like that. Anytime we left the base in a military convoy, you know, we were given a briefing and told, okay, you have to be aware. So just, just before I stopped doing the overseas stuff, I was, um, I was like, that was, I was in Afghanistan again near the end of it, and I came home. My brother and I went out to go see a movie in Montreal. On our way back, it was well, maybe about 11 o'clock. Downtown Montreal, come to a red light. There's a bus stop at the red light. There's a box of Pampers sitting there and nothing else. No one else. First thing that goes through my head is, that's out of place. That's an IED. We need to leave. Because I was really? trained to look for that. Like, they trained... Okay. You know, like I said, I was in an active war zone. You're not, but still, it's a little bit more dangerous than downtown, you know, mm -hmm. Toronto, Montreal. I believe you're in Calgary, right? So, like, downtown, yeah, LA. Like yeah. It. So, being in downtown yes. Tel Aviv or, you know, near the Dome of the Rock or something, it's slightly more dangerous than being in a city in North America. Yeah, yeah. It, we were in Jerusalem most of the time, but then we... We did go travel like up and down, like actually the entire country. But you know what? Actually, I it was in 2008, so it was actually pretty calm. Things were quite calm because I've to, I've spoken to people who have gone to Israel as well, and they wouldn't dare go into the West Bank, which I don't actually think that's necessary. I think that you can go if you, again, depending on the time mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. hostilities are over there. But I think I think kind of what you said, like we would always go out in groups. But I actually found, I felt the most, I don't want to say unsafe, but the most aware, per, well, because of the rules that they gave us. They just, it is school, you know, it is a university trip. So they did give us rules. We went on a weekend in Jordan and that's where I felt the most on, I guess, precautionary, I guess, because we weren't. When the women weren't allowed to go out, even in groups, we had to have a, a guy with us. Yeah, okay. We had to like, like, okay, I'll give you an example of what happened. So we, my, my friend, my, my little five foot four blonde, blue eyed her friend. So she, oh, sorry. I'm five ten, And like, I guess this is a podcast. So I'm, I've dark long hair. And so and I have like olive skin. So I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't look like I'm from there, but I'm just, I'm not western obviously looking like my little friend here but she so she and i wanted to go out it was probably around eight or nine but none of the guys on the on the in the group wanted to go 
on a walk or like around the, the city. We were in Amman. And um and so we're like, I guess we'll just sit on the hotel steps. Like we just sat on the steps. And um and some guy walked up to us and was like, Do you want a man? And we thought he was saying Amman, like to go into the city. Yeah. Like to go into Amman, you know? And we're like, no, no, we're fine here. And then he was like, no, no. Do you want and he said it? He didn't even say it trying to be like all cool. Yeah. He was just like, no, do you want a man? He was just so like very run of the mill. Like these girls, you want you want a man? No, yeah. So we were like, oh no, thank you. <laughs> Like, I mean, nothing happened to us, but it was just the, like, Israel felt Western to me, especially after being in Ethiopia, okay. and then, so then having our time in Israel, and then our weekend in Jordan, and back, you know, it just felt, and again, it depend on, depended on where we were, you know, in the country as well, um, but, it, like, we weren't, we, I think we were allowed to wear whatever we wanted, unless we were going into Arab areas. Like if we were in the, if we, we knew we were going to be in the Jewish uh, areas, you, you know, we could have our shoulders showing, for example. But if we are going to, like, like we did visit the Dome of the Rock. We weren't allowed in because we weren't Muslim. Yeah. But uh, we went and on the actual, uh, in the complex where, you know, it is. And so, and we had to wear, I think we had, no, I, did, I have pictures. I, I've looked back recently. And we had to have our shoulders covered, and I think we had to have our hair covered at some points, but maybe not, because I have pictures of my hair open and then ha my hair covered. I think I tried to go in and I covered my hair, and they said no, and so then, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see, like, on the outside of a mosque them making you, like, if it's the grounds of the mosque, I can see them trying to get you to cover your hair, but, uh, like, if you're just outside a mosque, I don't see them doing that. But I mean, I, I guess you would have to, you couldn't go to like the Wailing Wall in a mini skirt, and a, you know, on a tube top either, you know. No, and I don't even remember that, but I do, I just had a lot of scarves from Ethiopia. <laughs> like to be, to be completely honest, this is again my sort of, uh, this was 10 years ago, mind you. So I'm trying to remember, but I just had a lot of scarves. And so I just like had a lot of scarves on, you know, like over my shoulders, like whether I needed it or not, I just had a lot of scarves. And then, and then I even, I think maybe I even, I went to the Wailing Wall and I think I stuck a prayer in the, in the rocks, you know, or something and had my hair covered even in a picture. So I think I did that on my own, but yeah. So like after traveling and coming back, um, cause I mean, you were, you were gone for what, I guess it sounds like almost about six weeks or so. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, coming back, I mean, obviously, you know, the whole Tom Wolf thing, you can't go home again. Uh, or did you notice changes? Like, did you, were things slightly In different? Or did you appreciate stuff more? Like, did you appreciate it, the fact that, you know, the freedoms we have here more than, you know, where you were? I did. I mean, like, there are some, okay, there's about, a, there are layers, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd say the more surface one is particularly in Ethiopia, you know, the food that, that we have such an abundance. I mean, they had awesome fruit there, like mangoes, like were delicious, but they, the meat was not readily available. It, it, it like we, we, we tried hamburgers, American hamburgers, and I, I'm doing air quotes. <laughs> and it was like, the, I don't think they have the facility to make ground beef. So it was whatever the best they could. I guess it resembled more pulled pork, even though it was supposed to be beef. You know, I don't know. So, so, but the the fries were fine. So they knew how to do those. You know, so it it it's sort of just, um, again, I, I what am I thinking? Trying like, oh, I'll try American food in Ethiopia. Like that was so stupid. Just have their local food. <laughs> like don't, <laughs> whatever. But so that so that's kind of more surface. You know, just like that. But the thing I, th I think the thing I took away the most, so we, we, we spoke with Palestinians and we spoke with Jews. I mean, we had different classes almost. Uh, I mean, there wasn't, we did, wasn't, we did mostly 
travel, but there were t- some times where we had some speakers come in and we listened to them and, and, and times where we went into Palestine or not Palestine into the West Bank and listened to some people there, even attended some um, church services. Like we, we attended a church service from Palestinian Christians, you know, so that was a really interesting perspective. And, and even the place we stayed, it was, uh, it's run by Catholics. And so, and they're, they're there long term. So it's an interesting perspective on it. The, the Israel being, you know, kind of a contentious topic, of course, all, always. But it, I always was pro-Israel because, you know, my family, like I said, I come from a Christian background and I'm like, I follow Jesus and whatnot still. And so to me, it was always like, yeah, the Jews need a place. They need a place to be safe. And I'm a big fan of history and I'm, I'm very aware of what happened in the Holocaust and, you know, never again. So I, I very, very much was, oh yeah, I'm so happy to visit Israel and the, this place where the Jews have a haven. But then, you know, actually seeing Palestine, oh, sorry, I keep calling it Palestine, the West Bank and seeing these people and, oh, they're it, it shouldn't, it's not that it matters, but also there's some Palestinian Christians too. I can identify with them because they're the same faith as me, but you know, it's not, it's not the sort of other, like, oh, they're, they're Muslims and they're, they're not the same as the Jews. And so there's this conflict and that's whatever, but it's, it sort of opened up my eyes as to see, oh, it's not cut and dry. It's not, they, these people are the ones who need to, you know, give deference to the Jews and the Jews are always right on all the, the things they chose to do with the state. And I'm not saying I'm anti-Israel either, by the way. It just helped me to understand that it's a very, I mean, the land itself, it, it is a, it is quite the history, you know, just in general of, of who, who owns it, quote unquote. There's actually a really good YouTube video. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Just if you haven't, go take a, a look or if you want I can send you a link it's called this land is my land and it's like a is it is it that cartoon yeah and yes it's, i've it's, seen it because yeah. Jordan Peterson tweeted it out yeah. yeah and it's i mean it's but that that's exactly what that whole territory was right it yeah it was one fight after another it was one group of people taking it back and forth from another um and i mean okay the two of us talking about it we aren't going to fix it uh no you know it's it's and i like, okay, you were talking about okay, going into the West Bank. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if you see what's happening in Gaza now with the low, with the population themselves rising up against Hamas or demonstrating mm. against Hamas, right? Um, and then the West Bank, that was the, the Palestinian Authority. They didn't, you know. So people were saying, okay, we're going to have a two-state solution. But at that point, when it was Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, do you think you would have gotten a two-state solution? With those two, you know, they don't like each other much either, you know, as mm. well. So, the, you know, might have been a three-stage solution. Like, it's, you know, it, the, it's, the whole area is so complicated and there's a lot of stuff driving it. And, I mean, I, I still agree with the, the Hitchens thing that, you know, if you take the parties of God out of it, it would be a lot easier. I mean, mm. it, it is still a land issue, too. Uh, mm. But I mean, some of the land issues you also got to look at. There was, uh, and I'm going to get this wrong, so I might have to double check it and leave a link in the description when I post this. It, uh, I'll have to check with because my brother-in-law did a PhD um, uh, in Yiddish, but he studied a lot of the stuff. He also studied Hebrew, and he, uh, mm. he I think he got a master's in Jewish studies. So he he was talking about some of this, especially. Uh, he did the study of Yiddish in World War II. Uh, mm. So some of the land was bought, and it was actually Arabs that sold it with fake deeds to the British. And the British bought it knowingly that they were fake deeds. Mm. And so, you know, people putting it all, okay, it's all the Jews that did it to us. Mm. No, no. You know, there were some Arabs who did it as well. And I, I, like I said, I, I'd have to go back and check all my facts, so maybe I shouldn't even talk about it. You know, but there were some things along those lines. It well, the history matters, though. Yeah. It, it does matter. Yeah. So it wasn't just, you know, okay, we're going to give it to the Jews or whatever. But like, you know, there, 
obviously, you know, the British were involved, the, the French, mm -hmm. and, you know, they're, they're like the, the, that whole region, there's, it was post-war, people were doing stuff, um, and so, yeah, I mean, um, you know, like, it's... Well, and they needed a place to go, like, yeah. I, you know, I, I get it, like, literally, there was this famous boat that was turned around both at, uh, uh, of, of Jews that tried to leave and get to the States and Canada and both the States and Canada turned them around like during world world war two, you know, so I get, they need a place, you know? Yeah, no, like, exactly. Like I mean, I'm not denying all that and I'm not, see, I, I, I don't, these people want to go back and argue the formation. It's just like, okay, can we try to at least live with it now and then work it out and mm -hmm. try to find a solution? Like I said, you know, the two of us talking, we're not going to get far in it. It's, it, 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 there, there's too many stuff there's too much stuff going on to like you know like, and honestly like i think no offense to you but i think we're both woefully ignorant of a lot of the things no, that we are oh no no totally and 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 the, the reason the things that i learned from it yeah. it's not that oh i should not have been so wholeheartedly accepting yeah. israel as a jewish state it just sort of helped me to see it from the side of of a different perspective yeah. and to understand it isn't as cut and dry as, you know, it, we see on in the news or from what, you know, our parents tell us or whatever from our North American like shores, I guess. And, and it does, it, it's just informed me to, to maybe yeah, yeah, seek out more information to, to understand a, a situation that is that complex I, it just the, the situations like this are complex and not simple is what I guess I took away from that. So if you just had a curiosity about the, the Christians in Palestine, um, the ones you spoke with, at least did they feel like doubly threatened? Like were cause I mean, I've, I've read reports and stuff, obviously you know, I've mm -hmm. there and I haven't spoken to anyone from there of, you know, Christians, you know, Palestinian Christians being, attacked by Palestinian Muslims, that there is like, you know, again, all like there is a religious mm. difference in there. So like, did they talk about anything like that? Or was it, you know, did they you get know, on? I don't, I don't recall. I think that they said something along the lines of that it, it happens on a, on occasion, you know, but I mean, the, the community that we ended up, because the, 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 my professor who led the trip is friends with this pastor of this church. And so it, it was a longstanding friendship. So, you know, he, they're just, they were just so hospitable and only just wanted to talk about us. You know, they're like, Hey, how are you guys? Like, you know, we're so happy that you're here. Like they just were, I, I you know, they were just so happy. Like that's, that's why I don't even remember. I'm like, were they, did they talk about that? being you know having it be less safe for them because of their faith and i don't even remember because they were just they were like you know just rejoicing to have friends new friends over and so hospitable and so like happy and and like come back come back and see us and you know like it was just really i think that's what stands out in my you know the 10 year old memories but i will say this though i i, I do remember when we were in jordan a guide there's something else that, that that really changed my perspective with regards to culture and, and religions. Our guide was a, a a Christian Jordanian. Is that how you say it? Jordanian yeah. woman. And she, which is a very small percentage of the population there. But she said that not only in Muslim families, if their child, say, converts to, say, Christianity, do the, are there honor killings? But also in Christian families, if the children convert to Islam, there's honor killings on that side too. And that really, really took me back and, and made, changed how I saw, I suppose, my, I don't want to say my faith because I don't think that, mm, I'm going to say that that's not what Jesus would like, but, but it's just the way that, that, that it's practiced. I mean, come on. I know I have literally a Christian history de degree. I know the Crusades. I know God wills it and the slaughter of how many, but, but you know. Uh, what I'll say about that, though, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I oh, no, I, I'm done. I, no, I think that what 
the reason you'll have that is, okay, it is in all three faiths, right? I mean, if you want to talk about apostasy laws in the Abrahamic faiths, it started with Judaism, right? You know, those that, those that uh, try to take you away from the gods of your fathers, even if they are your brother, kill them, right? Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, that's in Christianity, and I'm, you know, like, I'm not a scholar of the, the religion like you were, but, you know, whatever it is, Matthew 15, like, you know, I, I come not to break the laws of the old prophets, you know, I come to uphold, not to break. So, I mean, Jesus, Jesus is saying, I'm upholding those laws. Like, in my mind, the thing that stops people from doing it is, you know, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. There's nothing mm. like that in Islam. Christianity mm. gives you that out. It also gives you the out with, you know, render unto Caesar is that which is Caesar and render unto God that which is God. Mm -hmm. so you separate, separation of yeah. church and state. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think if you look in liberal Western democracies, like, you know, countries that were founded to one, one extent or another values the enlightenment where they valued open discourse and they valued secular thought, the church lost power and had to give way. Whereas in Muslim countries, you know, the, was it the the eleven or the thirteen countries that will kill you for for blasphemy and apostasy are all Muslim mm. countries? So if that mm -hmm. is the norm, and if free expression and free thought aren't permitted, and then but they'll allow religious thought, right? So um, I just started reading this book by uh, David Deutsch, um, "The Beginning of Infinity," and he talks about mm. uh, dynamic and static thinking. Like, I was breaking it down into authoritarian and libertarian, like, not libertarian in the sense of, you know, where is Aleppo, like, but, like, you know, like, more classically liberal, even though I hate that term, but, you know, like, so, you know, mm -hmm. enlightenment values are authoritarian values, right? And mm -hmm. so, if you're based on that, if you're based on, like, an authoritarian system, which religion is, if you take it to that, like, if it's not a secular government, if it's a theocracy, if it's a religious-based government system, I find that authoritarian. Like, I, I don't think our, mm -hmm, our mm -hmm. systems are based on Judeo-Christian values. Um, but so that's why I can see Christians, even Christians, holding on to that. Because mm. there's nothing to temper it. There's nothing to, you, you know, like if you try to discuss blasphemy laws in a Muslim country, chances are fairly decent that you'll at least get imprisoned or whipped or something, right? Uh -huh. So that's why I think that even the Christians will do it because that's a lot of the ar that's a lot of the arguments I get from people when I discuss Islam. It's like, well, you know, oh, what about the Crusades? Well, Christianity did it as well. And I, you know, yeah, fine, they, it, it did. But, you know, show me a Christian state right now at this point that is advocating for death for apostasy, right? Like, these are individual nope. Christians in a Muslim country that are doing it. Right. You know, I, I'm not saying that it's not in Christianity or whatever, but that, that's... Anyways, yeah, what? That... Christian state? Like, there's not really, because it's a separation of church and state with any sort of, you know, classically Christian sort of country, right? Well, I mean, okay, technically the UK is a Christian country. I mean, the, the Anglican Church is the church of the, is the, of the nation. Uh, oh, I, suppose, yeah, I guess the Queen is the head of the church in yeah, that sense. she's the Pope, and, and when she dies or when she abdicates... Uh, she's not the Pope. She's yeah, she just is. The, no, that, that's, no, that, that's, that's why... Not no, the, the name Pope. Well, she's no, it's, just, it's, it's not the name of the Pope, but she's the head of the church. Yeah, no, I know. She is the head of the church. I'm just getting nitpicky. Yeah, 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 no, okay, yeah, I, I, was, I was just joking right. Okay, yes, she's no, not yeah. technically the Pope. But you know, yeah, but what Chuck will be soon, like you know. Yeah, Chuck. <laughs> Chuck. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Prince Charles. Oh no, we're gonna skip him. We're going to we're gonna go straight to William because he's cool. Wait, cool. no, it's Kate. We want Kate to be the queen. Okay. You're like okay. Who cares? <laughs> no, I, okay. Look, I I actually uh, okay. We're both Canadians. Mm -hmm. I, I realize that because of our parliamentary system and stuff, but I think we should be done away with that. I yeah, I do. I actually agree. It's kind of ridiculous. And even the fact that our prime minister yeah. can't be impeached and must be asked to leave by the governor general. Yeah. What? Yeah. And, and OK. Uh, I, I worked with the military a lot and Canadian military and NATO and stuff. But 
all the Canadian military messes have to have a picture of the queen. They swear to the queen, right? The queen is the head of our yeah. military and the head of state. Like when technically when Trudeau goes visits, he's not making a state visit. He's making a government visit. It's a governor general that makes state visits for Canada. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I barely know who the governor general is. Like I don't even know. I, I don't know who it is right now. Um, we barely know. They just, it's, yeah. Whatever the amount of money going towards the crown oh. and uh, I, I I don't like um, it, it's again like yes we are you know we, we're a parliamentary system based on there but why do we need to swear allegiance we can still keep the parliamentary system but yeah you know, we don't need to have this monarchy like why do we you know why like why do I have to swear allegiance to the queen like it's it's a strange almost worshipy kind of feel hey yeah it's it's just i, I don't like it at all um, yeah and i and i can see why um you know americans kind of like are like yeah we don't have to have that yay <laughs> you know but i do like our parliamentary system though in the sense that the the way that we have the official opposition and that the kind of that everyone is on equal ground when arguing in parliament, you know, and where even though I know with this current president, the respect level for president has gone like way down. But but I mean, I, I remember growing up and just because my I'm half American, my family's my mother's side is American. And so I just remember sort of that, you know, that sort of honor for the president and um, I, unless it was a president that they didn't like. But still, I mean, I still felt like there was a sort of, you know reverence and and the way that you know the mps speak to trudeau is just so and always for every any any prime minister it just always sort of like it, can't, it seems to kind of keep the humility in check you know for our prime minister well okay i mean i you could say that if you want but i don't know how much trudeau's humility is in check i, mm -hmm. I don't like that well you know, you're right i just like seeing Michelle Rempel yell at him for being a fake feminist, but yeah, yeah, okay, but I mean that's but there was actually a there was an interview with uh, Kretchen, and this was I was living in Vancouver at the time, so it's in the mid '90s sometimes, so like sometime after '95, uh, and he was speaking with and it was like just caught like you know, with a hot mic or whatever, and he didn't say anything offensive, but he was just talking to I believe like the Belgian prime minister, and he was saying, "Oh, he goes." As the Canadian Prime Minister with a majority government, I in some ways have more power to do things than the U.S. President. Because the U.S. President has all the checks and balances. But if you've got a majority government in Canada or any parliamentary system like that, if you have a majority government, as long as your party votes with your propositions, they'll pass. Mm. You can pass your laws, right? You might mm. pass a law that the country hates and you'll get voted out and that law will get repealed. But if you have a majority, you could push through whatever legislation you want. Because, I mean, that's how, that's one of the ways our government can stop is if they put forward some legisl legislation and the MPs vote against it and it gets voted down, that's a vote of non-confidence. And then the governor general has to dissolve the government, right? So that's like how it would work there. But oh. as long as you have a majority and you get your party's vote, you know, you can do whatever you want. But isn't it like that in the states? If you have majority in the Senate and in the House of Commons, like uh, okay, if you have majority in the in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, I'm oh, sorry, House of Representatives. Yeah, I mean, you you can get uh, you can get the legislation passed, but okay, so let's say you know when Obama was in power, and it was, mm -hmm. the Republicans had both the houses. If they yeah, but they it, had both the houses, so that so that is it. Wouldn't that be kind of similar to our yeah, okay, no, well, but they, having more? They can pass the legislation, but then Obama could veto it. Right. Okay. So there, it was like in, in that case, the, it was a Democratic president, but Republicans were in charge of the legislative branch, right? Uh, yeah, it, but it, then it, switch that president out to Trump, and he could. Then, yeah, right. he, he, he could pass. He, he could pass whatever he, could, he wants. He could do similarly. Yeah, but the, again, with the checks and balances, a lot of congressmen and you know senators, whatever, might if let's say Trump, for whatever reason, passes a bill saying I'm going to ban coal. Right, I don't think he will, but let's just say he, he proposes some yeah. sort of legislation like that. All the representatives from the 
from the you know the constituencies that are heavy reliant on coal will vote against that because they know they'll get voted out. Whereas okay. in Canada, I don't know why we don't have that. Like uh, a oh. lot of a lot of people say, okay, I'm going to vote for Trudeau, or I'm going to vote for Sheer, or I'm going to vote for you know Singh, or I'm going to vote for whoever. Right? That's not how we're supposed to do it. Like in the U.S., you can vote for Trump, or you can vote for uh, you know last time Trump or Hillary. You you chose. You choose your president, you choose your congressman, you cho- you vote for the president, you vote down ticket. The way we're supposed to do it is we're supposed to go look at our our MPs, the candidates in our yeah. riding. And the one we feel that will serve us the best in Ottawa is the one we're supposed to vote for. We're yes. not supposed to we're not supposed to care who the leader is. There there shouldn't be a national campaign. It should be local campaigns and you should hold your local uh, candidates feet to the fire and say, if you don't represent us and our interests in Ottawa, uh, we're going to vote you out. And, oh, and, and, but we're kind of stuck because we want a certain leader. Yeah, and exactly. But we're not supposed to do that. So if, you know, like if let's just say it's Trudeau and he, he puts in everyone and says, okay, I'm going to put you in, but you're going to vote exactly how I want you to vote. That person is not a good candidate for you. But if that person says, no, you know what, you're asking me to do this, I don't agree with it, I'm going to vote against it, at least that person, you know they're, they're standing up for their writing, they're doing what's best for their writing, and that's what it's supposed to be. And, and it's the, the party who has the most writings that we're not supposed to vote for a leader, we're supposed to vote for our, our candidate. And I think that's... But should, shouldn't we be able to vote for our leader and then our candidates? Like, like, is that what you mean about the American system, why that might be a bit better? No, no, I... Okay, no, we have to change our whole system then. But I mean, like, if we want, oh, no, we can't. Yeah, we like, can't. Okay, yeah. like sticking with the parliamentary system. Like that's what I've been telling a lot of my friends, and that's actually what I think I'm going to start doing, like going forward and in coming into this election. Is okay, yo, don't vote for the leader. Vote yeah. for your candidate. Go see your candidate. See which ones you actually like. Look at look at what they're about. And if you're not if you're not happy with them, spoil your ballot. Like I I think that. Why spoil the ballot, though? Because okay, the people who sit at home and don't vote, so I think in Canada it's roughly between 35 and 40%. percent hmm If all those people got off their ass and went and spoiled their ballots, uh-huh. they're going to take into account that, okay, 40% don't vote, right? And so they write those people off. But if enough people, like I said, if, if that... If that percentage got up and went and spoiled their ballots, they count the spoiled ballots. Like, mm. And so they can tell you, okay, you know what? Uh, 30% of the people who voted spoil their ballots. So, I mean, imagine that like, you, you have a winner. Someone wins as prime minister. But the largest number of votes went to none. The largest number of votes went to, these people are all sacks of shit. Give me a better choice. Yeah, like, yeah. Imagine, like, okay, th- if that doesn't send a message to the parties, nothing will. Like sitting at home and saying okay. not voting doesn't send a message. Right. That makes sense. I actually think that would have been nice f- um, for uh, the 2016 election for the Americans who did not know who to vote for. That would have been that would have been something to do if you're like a rock hard place and, and me, you know. Yeah. But but for here, yeah, that's an interesting concept. I haven't thought. Of. OK, I mean, Trudeau, I. From from the start, I found everything he did really repugnant. Yeah. Or at the very least, cringeworthy. Like his yeah, whole, his, yeah. whole, his whole thing, like, why do you have a gender balanced cabinet? And I have no problem with a gender balanced cabinet. I wouldn't have a problem with an all female cabinet. Okay, I don't care. Yeah. His answer should have been, we found the most qualified people. But oh, yeah. You know, but with that little smirk that and then like, yo yo know, you know, well because it's 2015, that's not a fucking answer. It's not an answer yeah. for oh, oh, you know the leader of a country. Uh, other things about him, okay, like the one thing that I will never forgive him for, and mm-hmm. uh, it was when he was doing those town halls, and I believe it was in Edmonton, and a guy got up and said, "Well, all these ISIS fighters you're letting back in, you know, in ten years from now, how are you going to be able to say I can keep my daughter safe?" And Trudeau went on yeah. to say, "Well, you know." 
we've always let in immigrants, and Canada's always had a big thing of letting in immigrants, and after the war, we let in the Italian and the Portuguese, and then we had the, you know, I'm sorry, but you are equating, like, my family with people who left Canada, spat in yeah. whatever Canada gave them, whether it was citizenship, residency, or whatever, went and joined a bunch of murderers and rapists and slavers, and yeah. you were saying that they are immigrants? Like I'm sorry, yeah. no. I, 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 like for that on its own, there is no way in hell I can ever support that man. Well, it, and it seems, yeah. So it, with the, with, I think he's trying to equate this sort of anti-Islamic. Sorry, he's trying to say that's Islamophobic to not let in these ISIS these ex-ISIS fighters, is that kind of the vibe you got from that? That he's trying to well, okay, virtue he, sig signal his... Okay, his, his, whole, his, old, his whole tenure as prime minister has been the one big giant virtue signal. Um, yeah. But, I mean, he, he said it in Parliament when people were, you know, questioning about ISIS, he called it Islamophobic. And yeah. he's like, no, yes. you know, it's, it's not. You're, you we're asking valid questions. And I, okay... Personally, I don't think, I think any person who left Canada to go fight for ISIS, I think before they come back, if you want to allow them to come back, we can have that discussion. I'm of the opinion is they gave up their citizenship to join somewhere else and they don't have citizenship anymore, but like whatever, mm -hmm. I, we can get into that whole argument, but I'm saying before we even bring them back and any of the ones who are back here, send them back to Syria and Iraq. All the money you're going to spend on trying them, mm -hmm. do an investigation there, try them there for war crimes. The people in that area, as far as I'm concerned, have the first right to get justice from these people. I you, see. Okay. You know, I, 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 if they come back, try them for treason, whatever. But that doesn't get any bit of justice for the people in those places. You know, the right. people who were raped by them, the people who's kids were kidnapped and turned into killers by them mm -hmm. you know it doesn't give any justice to those people I, I don't think any question of them coming back should be dealt with until you can deal with the with the war crimes that were committed um and mm -hmm. even like there was a the rcmp had put out a report i think it was in 2017 i'd have to look at the article again um that you know about how it's almost impossible to actually try these people in canada for any kind of war crime and, really? Well, where are you going to get the evidence? All the evidence, oh, cool. any any, any chance of evidence, any chance of witnesses or anything, it's all over there. Right. You know, th there's none of it here. There are a few Yazidi, uh, Yazidis here, and there was an article that came out last year, or earlier this year, uh, and it was horrible. And it was like these Yazidi women in Canada getting uh, threatening phone calls saying, we're going to come back and rape you, we're going to come back and finish you off, and... Oh my gosh. You know, like, so you have some people here, but almost anyone who can identify them, almost anyone who can do anything is living in that part of the world. If right. If they're still alive. So go back there and investigate these people there. And I think those people, you know, you know like, I'm sorry, I'm going on along about this, but those people have yeah, the first yeah. right to get some sort of justice and, um, Okay, you were talking earlier about, and this is funny because um, I, I spoke about with someone about this last week. I just put it out, but I'm saying the exact same thing here. It's um, there was a book called uh, "We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed with Our Families," and it's a book about the oh. Rwanda, it's a book about the Rwandan genocide. And oh. the, guy, the guy who wrote the book was talking about it, and he was talking about how he was at either the opening of a Holocaust museum in New York City. Or if it was like it was an event going on at you know the Holocaust Museum, and everyone was uh -huh. talking about never again, and uh -huh. at the same time as they were talking about never again, the Rwandan genocide was going on at such a, such a clip that I think uh -huh. that in a th like the the study puts up that in a three month period, the rate at which they were killing, like outstripped any rate of murder that the Nazis had committed during the Holocaust. Oh really? Oh and, my goodness! And they were just doing it with like machetes and um you know they would take like the leaf suspension off trucks and turn that into machete like weapons and things like that they were just doing it just like that they, there was mm. no organized 
state system for, you know, uh, like the way they set up the death camps in Germany and, and uh, Europe. Right, right. And so, you know, he was like saying that, so that, you know, they were talking about never again, but it was going on as they're talking about, it. you know, it, and, and like, that's what I feel about like with this, with ISIS, it's the, the Yazidi have been left. I mean, there, there was so many other, there was other people as well, but the Yazidis are the most, the ones you can exemplify the easiest because I mean, there was Christians as well and Jews and Shia and Sunni who didn't think mm -hmm. right. And, you know, whatever, you know, any, if there's any uh -huh. Hindus or anything there, they were all in the same boat, but, uh, you know, and there's article after article like coming out from from Yazidi people and saying, you know, the, people are talking about ISIS brides and no one's talking about what we suffered. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I I don't I I have I can't see how any of them come can come back without at least being investigated for war crimes and even the women like some of the stuff these women you know uh, they would prepare the sex slaves for their husbands. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, a term over the report I read today. It was really horrific. And uh, two Yazidi women were caught fasting based on their religious traditions. And uh -huh. they were locked up and beaten by the, you know, the wives in that house, like the wife in that household or the wives, these guys, they can have four wives, right? Um, and the men as well, and they were force fed by the wives, and you know, it's like you know, the, the, these aren't oh, we, we you know, these aren't innocent women here. They did oh, horrific. and that's yeah, that's something that I find rather insidious. This sort of idea that women—that's sort of the current fashion, I guess, for thinking that women are these um angels that are that are morally superior to men you know like like that's that's something that is a result of the current thinking i think right that these women can get away with that that's like that's an old trick you know oh she didn't understand you know during the civil war you know things like or any time of war you know oh she like don't don't blame the woman she she's too gentle and un, unknowing to commit such you know and it's like no we're just people yeah. we're, we we can commit any crime on oh, the same as men we're just not as typically aggressive so yeah and i mean it was also it was with that uh the one from the uk that got into the news recently shamima begum um and i mean okay she lost a child she lost the baby she was carrying when she wanted to come back to the uk they were you know they, they, they denied their they canceled her citizenship and all that and she'd also lost mm -hmm. two other children while she was living with ISIS. Mm. Heartbroken about the children. I have mm -hmm. no sympathy for her. Mm. And a lot of people mm -hmm. were saying, oh, well, she was 15 when she went over there. She didn't really know she was groomed. And and quite a lot of the people that I saw saying that about her were vilifying the kids from Covington. Oh, I know. Oh, man. And like, oh. Th those were 15, 16-year-olds. Oh, so, so, you know. Yeah. If you're going to give her a pass from abetting and rape and murder and slavery, maybe give those kids a pass for a smirk. Yeah, know? that's actually so that sort of double standard. And I mean, OK, let's you know, there's that, you know, take the plank out of your own eye before you reach for the speck in your brother's eye. Like, I know we all do that where we have we we. We give people in our own tribe a pass and then, you know, point our finger at the other tribe. So I get that. But it's just so, like, so obvious, you know, when you stand them up next to one another. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, like, 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 things like that just tick me off. Okay, they double standards. There is a... Yeah. Well, what do you think about this whole, um, I think, is it in Behar? Is that the uh, right country? About the gay rights. Oh, that's Brunei. Sorry, Brunei. Yeah. So that it's a crime. I mean, it's uh, a crime in many Muslim countries to uh, be. Okay. Uh, Brunei already all, already had the death penalty for homosexuality. So why is it just all of a sudden in the news again? Because now that's punishable by stoning. Oh. Whereas before maybe it was hanging. I don't know. Oh, um, but stoning is rough. Yeah. I mean, okay, come on. It's uh I've seen one video, and I don't know how true it is, but it was from a woman in Afghanistan. Yeah. And it was horrific. I mean, yes. they basically bury them, like, 
up to the shoulders and yeah. a bunch of people sit around them and they just throw stones at the head. And it's not like, you know, they're throwing small rocks. They're not small throwing like a big boulder and caving in her skull, right? It, it is meant to be painful. Um, yeah. It's so, I, yeah, I mean, it, it is horrific. Uh, I watched a, a movie years ago. It was based on a true story of someone who did some investigative reporting. I think it was in Iran, and it's called The Stoning of Soraya M. Yeah. And um, have you heard about it? Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, it's... Yes. And so, I mean, I it, it's a movie, so it's not real stoning, but I mean, it I mean, it looks real and, and it's horrific. And it's uh, her husband wanted to divorce her because he couldn't afford a second wife and she wouldn't give him a divorce. And so I think he accused her of adultery and kind of coerced another dude to corroborate. And, uh, yeah, it's horrible. And it really happened, too. Yeah. And, I mean, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a video going out today about, uh, I can't remember what she did, but, um, she, like, she she's getting flogged in public in, um, in Afghanistan. Okay, okay. Oh, she listened man. to music and they flogged her. Oh, yeah, it's it. I per I well, I did. I didn't participate. I I guess I had a solidarity like thing on Twitter where there was this in February on February first. It was World Hijab Day, yeah. but at the same time there was uh, no hijab day. Yeah, okay, <laughs> or no, free, well, okay, no, free yeah, from hijab. Free yeah, from hijab. Well, there was day. free from hijab, but there was also no hijab day. Um, yeah, it was actually. Um, so I'm, I'm friends with Yasmin Muhammad and yeah, I was, she's the one who was kind of keeping the updates about yeah, it. And yeah, I, and, yeah. And so there was also free from hijab, which was being run by Asra Namani. Yeah. And so they did a live stream actually on that day. And mm. so there was, uh, Asra Yasmin came on later because she's out in the West coast and, um, it was early for her, but, um, so she came on in like the last hour, but it was like three and a half hours. Uh, mm. Four hours. There was uh, like I actually hosted it for them, and like, but they were like, oh, I, cool. I, just, I was just in the background. I didn't talk or anything. They were like, you know, mm. I don't have anything to contribute to. But uh, yeah, if you want, I'll send you the link to it. It was uh, yeah, um, I missed it actually, yeah, but it was, but okay, it's long. I'll, I'll give you that. It's like you know, it's it's quite a while, but uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll check out some of it. Well, yeah. I I do have a a friend who escaped from Saudi Arabia, and so I. I just wanted to support her, and yeah. so I just, you know, tweeted about her and retweeted her stuff, and and like that's I think that the thing I I tweeted about was the fact that when I went to Israel and when I tried to go into the Dome of the Rock and I covered my hair and they said no, and that's my extent of wearing a hijab. Well, actually, <laughs> so, in, in that video, Asra went to a mosque and she got thrown out of the mosque. Yeah. Because she didn't have a well, hijab. No, she, she had her hair covered and all that, but she, because she was talking on her phone during a live stream, they oh. kicked her out and they called the cops because she was recording. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I didn't know. They just don't want people to see in. Well, they had a they had a it's a policy of the mosque like no recording on the on the mosque steps. Oh, um, whatever. Well, but, like, but yeah, there there was that. But I mean. The, the hijab day thing, okay, that's the, the no hijab day thing. Yes. So not not the this past February, but February of last year. So just before this uh, world hijab day was happening, so maybe a week at the most, maybe two. Um, mm -hmm. I'd sent Yasmin a message, and, and she was sending a message to me and a bunch of other people. And basically, we said the same thing. I said, like, this world hijab day is ridiculous. Like, you should get something of, like, having people videoing themselves taking the hijab off like women. Mm -hmm. and so then she sent out one to, like, so to myself and a few other people and said, you know, I'd like to get people to, you know, take a hijab off and burn it and do no hijab mm -hmm. today. So there's actually mm -hmm. a video floating around of me taking a piece of cloth off my head and lighting it on fire. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And that's the origins of it? Well, I, I don't want to say, like, we thought about it and, I mean, yes, okay, I don't want to take like any real credit for it. It was just it was just coincidental. But Yasmin was the one who got it started and you know right you know, got it going. Well, it was just like the two of us sent each other this basically the same yeah. idea at the same time. But you know, like well, she she's the person who got it going and everything. I'm I'm so glad that there is a counter 
movement, I guess I'll say a counter day to this because I think I I am very anti hijab in regards to laws and 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 what it means guardianship laws wise and all the things that it's sort of connected to. If women want to wear it here and they choose to, uh, fine. I'm not going to interfere with your your rights uh, of uh, individual expression. I suppose of of you know what what you wear. But I find it horrible, the idea of Western women wearing a hijab to support women who to wear hijabs when so many people, I mean, you click on that hashtag, you know, the, the free from hijab, yeah. if you click on it, it's just full of, I mean, I almost got teary eyed reading some of these things. These women, like, I just want my hair to feel the sun. I want to feel the sun, you know, like yeah. I want my hair to to have wind go through it, you know, I, I just so and they don't have a choice. And it just makes me so angry to think that women here are supporting oppression. OK, I not going to argue one iota with that. But OK, I want, <laughs> I, I, want, I, I want your take on this because okay. here's my feeling on this. And it's so in Quebec, they're passing this law. And they're calling it, you know, secular law or whatever, and they're using the French term laïcité, where no yeah. government official can wear a religious symbol. Oh, see, oh, that one's hard. I see. For for me, I have the like, I, like I believe, like I said, I, I, I want to talk about what your foundational principles are, what what people's first principles are. I think that's where we should come from. For yeah. me, like I believe in the values of enlightenment, and that includes freedom of religion, but that also mm -hmm. includes and. A, I'll get to why I'm including this, but that also includes innocent until proven guilty. You have to have the presumption of innocence on any one person. So mm -hmm. everything you said about the hijab, I have no problem with what you said. I Same thing. It's, it's a horrific. It's misogynistic. It's oppressive. It's mm -hmm. rape culture. It's done because the hair of a woman might incite lust in men. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whatever the individual reason why a woman wears it, and if she's doing it of her own free will, no problem. But that—that's what it represents. But mm -hmm. now, I know ex-Muslim women who, even when they were no longer practicing, but they were hidden from their family, where they still are, mm -hmm. are forced to wear it but they don't believe anything about it, right? So let's say one of these women has a job working for the government. That's a little bit of freedom that she gets to get out from her family, from prime mm. eyes or whatever. Yes, she mm -hmm. has to wear it, but at least the people there know she, you know, she doesn't want to wear it, whatever. Mm -hmm. If this law goes into force, you are assuming just by what she's wearing that she's not going to give you service fairly. She's not going to treat you fairly. She's going to she holds all these beliefs. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the bigoted part of this thing. That, that's a prejudicial part of this law. You are denying someone the right to practice their faith. And at the same time, you are presuming guilt of an action that they haven't done. And you're presuming that they will commit that action just based on what they're wearing. It could be a right. crucifix. It could be a yarmulke. It could be a, a hijab. It could be a star of David. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about Sikhism, but I'm sure, I want to say I'm they're, pretty sure that there's, there's something in there that's, yeah. you know, there, there's stuff in Hinduism that, you know, uh, treats women unfairly as well. So there's, like I said, I, I don't believe in any of that stuff. Like, you know, I don't believe in any of the faiths and I don't believe in any of that misogynistic crap mm. or, or, or any of like the, 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 you know, if you're talking about Islam, like the, 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 the the, the homophobia, the you know, the the xenophobia, the fear of the other, the, the bigotry against all other faiths, all of that, uh -huh. and, and sorry, all the Abrahamic faiths have that. You know, mm. by dint any religion, you think you're superior to others, so you have yes, at least a yeah, bit, a, a bit of that. above yeah, yeah. Yeah, others, yeah. yeah. So like, I'm against all that, but I don't want the state telling someone how to practice their faith. I don't want the state like. I want that wall. I don't want the state going in meddling in the affairs of, you know, the church, like globally. Or, yeah. 
and the individual expression. Yeah, of but faith, okay, yeah. at the same time, like let's say it's a church that's, you know, uh, what's what you know the whole uh, pedophilia thing with the Catholic Church now. Yeah. Okay. Yes, the state has to step in and arrest people, and people yes. have to be tried for that. That's not the state coming in and passing laws, right? Oh, totally and, different. And it's it's also not the state. Like if I go to the license bureau or to get my you know healthcare card or whatever, right? And the person in there is wearing a religious symbol. It's not that's not the state foisting their religion on me. That's yeah. A, so yeah. Okay. So I remember when there was that whole thing with Harper and the niqab thing, yeah. and that's kind of the hill he died on, and then he ended up losing. Yeah. I feel like the niqab thing was different because it's face covering and it's, I get, you need to see someone's face for identification for getting your picture. Like that's what that was about. I is what I, my understanding was. Yeah. That's, that's for a government. I, yeah. Sorry. So I, I do think so that, that's something that I've kind of, that's the last I've thought about for Canadian government dealing with religious symbols in that way was thinking about the niqab and, and I did think that they should not have their face covered so that we can identify them properly. So that was something that I was on the side of on that. But then with regards to just wearing a hijab in your daily job, if you work for the government, I don't, all the things you said, I agree with the sort of struggle. I, I know what a hijab symbolizes and what it, you know, stands for and whatnot. But I do think that, the freedom of expression of to, to, to practice your religion. I, I mean, what if it was it was me? And I, I mean, I don't wear anything um, like coverings or anything. Obviously, there's not really anything for Christianity. But like, I don't know. What if I don't want the, anyone being felt like they're having the state come after them for their religion? And it feels like that is getting into that territory of the state invading your practice of your faith. Yeah. And like I said, it, it could be a crucifix. It could be a star of David. It could be, you know, so it, even necklaces, like even jewelry. Well, well, they said any, any religious, you know, any religious object. What if you have a, a tattoo? That's, I mean, you can cover up a tattoo. Um, I guess so. I don't. I, I like, just... I, like I, I was going to question, um, because I, I see it in India, and it's like I see Sikhs and sometimes some Hindu men wearing these beaten silver bracelets. And it's something to do with faith. Um, but, like, is that is that considered a religious symbol? I know, no, yeah. Like no, no one, unless you knew, no one would really know. And I don't know much about it. Like I said, like, I'd have to look it up. But, you know, unless you knew, you wouldn't be able to spot that out. It could just be a guy wearing a silver bracelet, right? For what reason. about yoga pants? Like yoga, yeah. yoga pants. <laughs> yeah, okay, but I don't think you should be wearing yoga pants to the office. But, I you know. suppose, I suppose. Okay, I guess it is government jobs only. I, I think if I was going to vote on it right now, and I'm not even in Quebec and you are, but I mean, I, if I was, I would vote no. Yeah, that, it's, sorry. It's, it's not a referendum. It's, it's, I think it just got passed. And oh, okay. Well, then I would probably be, I'm again, I would be against that because I think that's getting too into people's individual lives and expression of their faith. Like the way this whole thing played out was really weird too, because first they said that they were going to pass this law. Then, because there's a giant crucifix and it's called the Blue Room in the National Assembly. Uh huh. It's, giant, it's not giant. It's maybe like a, you know, a, a foot long and like you know, eight inches across, right? Um, they. They said, no, no, that, that's part of our history. That doesn't represent anything except for history. I'm like, well, that's a crucifix. It's a religious symbol. And if that's the only one, that is, to me, the state pushing a religion. So that should come out of any government building. But then they said, okay, then we're only going to do this with Muslims first, and then we'll see how it goes. I'm like, well, no, Oh, that not. seems really bad, actually. <laughs> yeah, but now that the thing got passed, it seems like it's all across the board, no religious symbols. Um and like I said, I'm, I'm completely opposed to it. I mean, as, as opposed as I am to the hijab and as opposed as I am to the thinking in, you know, like I said, at least the Abrahamic faiths uh, and, and others as well. I mean, I can, but, you know, I, I, I can't see 
any good coming out of the government meddling in how people practice their faith. Yes, and it does seem extreme in regards to our what our country is is based on. Although I do, I must admit, I know I know American laws and you know the Constitution and you know the um, the amendments and whatnot much better than I know our own. Because the, in the states, they are like we're founded based on our desire for freedom, and here we're founded on based on our ability to provide beaver pelts for well, hats. <laughs> but I mean, okay, look up the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and look up Section Thirty Three. Um, okay, it's called the Notwithstanding Clause, and uh -huh. basically, any government that can pass a law, and I believe that's it's federally and provincially, it might even go down to the municipal level, but I don't think so. But a provincial, uh, and so they can use section 33 to, uh, if they use that clause, so this law goes into effect, notwithstanding, you know, and they list off the sections of, you know, clauses in like the following sections. One of the sections is the section that grants you all the individual freedom. So freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, all those individual freedoms. So yeah. you can use an notwithstanding clause to override that section of the charter. Yeah. So you can say, okay, this law is going into effect, notwithstanding, you know, these clauses. And by that, our charter is worthless. And if you use an notwithstanding clause, it goes into effect for five years. And that's because, you know, that's, that's the, how the, the longer term can be for a government. Like I, uh -huh. they might want to change it now because the federally, at least it's only four years now, but, um, you know, a mandate can go as long as five years. So every five years, it's got to be voted on again. So if they've passed it this year in five years, the government has to say, are we going to, uh, vote, are we going to keep the notwithstanding clause? And if they don't, then it can, there could be a constitutional challenge, but right now. It's oh man, I'm interested to hear how it plays out. But okay. In Quebec, as soon as the notwithstanding clause came in. I think for the first eight or nine years, every law that was passed used it. And no government, like, you know, normally in Quebec, it's the liberals or the, it used to be the Parti Québécois. I would go back and forth. Neither government ever rescinded the other government's use of it. Um, mm -hmm. Even in the 90s, some of the, the, some of the laws passed in Quebec were using it. So it's being used a lot in Quebec. And it's never been rescinded. So how that plays out, I don't know. Um, but like mm. I said, so for five years, any law that uses that, our charter is worthless for that amount of time based on that one law. So, huh? Well, I guess we'll see in five years how yeah. it goes. Man. Yeah, I mean, like I, mean, I, I, I don't like this law, and a lot of people I know and respect are, oh, this is great. This is great for secularism. I'm like, this has nothing to do with secularism. It's it's oh, it's, man. Gov it's, it's government meddling in, in religion. And oh, you know, that that line of, well, I don't like the things that they do or say, so let's ban that. Like, that feels like that. Yeah, you can still you can still say I don't like those things, yeah. but you can you could you still give the rights, though. Exactly. I mean, I, I, I've been calling a lot of these things overcorrections. Mm. And it's okay, it's, it's going to sound a little cliche or whatever, but like. At least for the last year, probably a year and a half, this quote by Milton has been going through my head because I keep seeing it over and over again. And it's from Paradise Lost. And it's basically, it's, it's you know, a bash the devil stood and felt how awful goodness is. And so. Is it evil be thou my good? No, no. It, he, it's, okay, that's the one that's my favorite quote from that. Sorry, I couldn't hold it back. No, no like I said, it's, it's a bash the devil stood and felt how awful goodness is. Okay. And saw virtue in her shape how lovely and pined his loss. Now, mm -hmm. the way I read that is the lost devil's pining is not just the loss to, you know, heaven's armies. Mm -hmm. He's pining the loss of being the bad guy because he saw really? how awful goodness was. He saw how implacable goodness was. Goodness came in and showed him what it meant to be awful. Like, no mercy, no, no compassion, no nothing. Just the implacable nature of goodness to wipe out evil. Oh, and, that's and he missed it. And, no, but he, he lost that. 
Satan thought he was the awful guy. Satan thought he was, you know, I'm the evil person, right? God is good. I'm evil. I'm, I'm the bad guy. But then he saw uh -huh. how awful goodness was. And he's like, I'm not oh. the bad guy anymore. And you think that's the loss he's pining. But like, oh. you know, like when I see things like this, I'm like, you're turning goodness awful. You're not, you, you mm. might be, you might be saying you're fighting for secularism. You might be, you know, if you were opposing the hijab and if you're opposing forced hijab, I'd be right there with you. You know, mm. if, you were, if you were opposing uh, Jewish women having to wear a wig and some of them having to actually shave their head before they put that wig on because of modesty culture, I'm right there with you. Mm. you know, but I'm not there when you are forcing them not, you know, when you're forcing them the other direction. Like I said, mm. you're, make, you're making goodness awful. You're not, you're not doing good. It's like a balance, you know, it's like, oh, we can't put all our eggs over here in the one basket. It's, you know, it's, you you can't just keep going in one direction. You've almost got to always correct. I always call it like a pendulum. Like you have to correct it. Otherwise it's off balance. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. I, you know, I'm not going to say that I, I would be happy if, we never went down the line of faith. Mm. I would be happy if that particular dogma never, never came around. But mm -hmm. at the same point, it's here. You know, people practice it to whatever degree. Some accommodations are going to be made for it, and you know, I'm not here to wipe out religion or. Anything along those lines. I'm just here. Okay, I want. You know, like I said, my fight is free expression. My fight is for enlightenment values. And those are what I want to support. Mm -hmm. I'm not going mm -hmm. out tilting at windmills anymore. I'm not going out fighting. You know, the insanity of social justice. And when I say social justice, I'm not talking about like the Martin Luther King, like the the, the stuff mm -hmm. that we see now that goes under the guise of social justice, right? I, I, uh -huh. I you know. You can rail against that. You can rail against, uh, you know, dogmatic thinking in, in any form. Um, or mm. you can, like uh, Deutsch would say, static thinking. Um, the, the, but I would much rather, instead of railing against all those things, I would much rather just say, okay, this is what I'm for. This is what I'm going to support. And mm. I'm going to support these principles. If mm, something I comes along that. that goes against those principles, then, yeah, fine, it's in conflict with me. But I'm not going out looking for this conflict. I'm mm. only going to speak in a way, and I'm failing miserably at this, but I only want to speak. No, in a way. you try though. You got to try. Out. No. I like that. That's that's a healthy. Uh, um, well, yeah, and and I'd say I mine are very similar to that, and and I usually I prefer to go to the individual level, and that's where I start. Is I I do when you say like first principles and foundational, like my foundational values are that each individual has intrinsic value and that no one has like on a base level, no one has more value than anyone else because we all have this, you know, like the Jordan Peterson style divine logos sort of, that's kind of my thinking, you know, um, and that each person is, is, should be treated with uh, respect and with dignity, and I, I try to. That's how I try to live my life, and that's how I try I approach people uh, when I'm on Twitter. I know people often say how it's Twitter's horrible and a cesspool and whatnot, but I, I, I don't know. For some reason, it's really easy for me to see. To I, I always remind myself there's someone behind the screen. There's someone typing this. And am I con going to contribute to their, like, th them having a positive or negative experience? Am I going to treat them as an individual, as a person who has worth? Or just be like, that's stupid, you know? <laughs> like, so that's, yeah, that's where, where I'm coming from is the, is just to, to treat people, um, as if they all each each have an individual value. Yeah, no, that's a like like that's you know that's a good way to go about it too. Like I, and I mean, I, I was actually talking to someone about this, and I was talking about how 
the or say the foundational values of New York, it's the, you know, like, I would say the free speech is the foundation upon which you build all the other rights. And I was looking mm-hmm. at these rights as a foundation, and then I was speaking with a friend of mine, and he said, you know, because well, I was thinking more like a wooden frame, kind of like how they had the built the houses in Japan, um, and they still kind of do like to make it a, a foundation that moves with earthquakes, and you don't have you know you have very little loss of of you know houses and stuff like that because of the way they built. And I, for me, I started thinking about it. I'm like, okay, you know what? I want to think of these principles as a garden. And mm. so, what I consider foundational principles, they're the earth. Mm. It's very easy for it to be washed away. It's very easy for it to dry out. It's very easy for it to be overrun with weeds. So you've got mm. to tend it. You've got to take care of it. You've got to make sure it grows properly. And as thing as other values and laws and you know ethics start coming out of this mm. are they compatible with what you want so mm. you know if let's say you have like a, you know, a society built on the, the values and enlightenment so like the united states and a law comes up that we're going to kill every third person just for the sake of doing it mm. you know does that fit in with the values of you know like no, it doesn't. So that's a weed. We take it out. We throw it away. But if something else comes along that fits in with the values that you founded the country on, you let it grow, and it you know, and then yeah, fine. As that grow, you know, as that grows, you might have to prune it or something. So that that's mm. I'm thinking like that might be a better way to look at like these foundational principles or first principles, as opposed to like thinking of them of as a foundation that's very rigid, because I don't right. think these things can be completely rigid like i don't think we should give them up but they have to have some room to move right oh that's interesting i'll have to contemplate that right because not everything's gonna fit in the mold necessarily then we'll have to apply yeah. um, anyways but i i've got to run yeah, it's, i was just about uh, to say it's getting a little late i think I yeah you longer than you know we had to yeah and you're up. and you're yeah you're a later time zone than me so anyways uh if you have anything else you want to, you know, if you had anything coming out, where could people find you? Oh, um, I'd say, I mean, I have usually stuff, uh, videos coming out every week, but um, I just put one out uh, today about the Vogue, Teen Vogue, uh, biological sex denial oh, God. Uh, video. So I did a response. And so that's my latest, and um, I guess I have to get I have to get my YouTube name figured out better. But you you can my link is up on my Twitter bio, and so uh, you can follow me at the other all one word like the other underscore and then uh, ninety five, but and written ninety five written in numbers, and uh, and my YouTube link is there in my bio to get to my channel so well all right well thank you very much it was, uh, and i love out. twitter so i love i love twitter anyway everyone who wants to <laughs> chat with me on twitter i will chat with you anyway <laughs> yeah and actually you know there is one thing i have to i i wanted to take issue with here uh, before i let you go is i mean you, what? you you put yourself down as andrea the canadian with bangs now i live in canada i have some friends with bangs so you obviously aren't the Canadian with bangs. You're well, like, I am on Twitter, though. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure there's other Canadians on Twitter with bangs. But yeah. <laughs> anyways, well, I I've titled myself that way. So, <laughs> anyway. Go. Well, thank you very much again, and uh, like I'll I'll post all your like your your Twitter handle and all that uh, when I put this out. Thanks again for coming mm-hmm. on. Thank you everyone for listening. And I'll awesome. Be back. All right. Thanks. <laughs>